go. All right, I guess we're getting started here. Uh, so hello everyone here and watching at home on our Twitch TV live stream and welcome to the first ever Horizon conference. Uh, yeah. uh, so I'm Brandon Boyer, uh, I run the video game culture site Venus Patrol. Uh, before we get underway, I wanted to say a few quick words. Uh, the idea for Horizon came almost exactly one year ago uh, as my friend Corey Schmitz and I just wondered aloud what it would be like to hold our own press conference uh, that was dedicated entirely to the kinds of games that get us excited to be working in this field. Neither of us had any experience actually doing anything like this, uh, but our friends like Double Fine's Greg Rice, our friend Matthew Kumar, and honestly like a dream team of developer friends all seemed to agree that it was something actually worth trying. Uh, the amount of positive support we've received over the past several months has been extremely heartening. So thanks to everyone who believed in this, especially you here in the audience and watching at home. Uh, we'd also like to give a huge thanks to the team at Area 5 who worked like crazy overtime yesterday, making sure the proceedings were going to be filmed and streamed. Uh, these guys are super pro. You might recognize their name from the making of documentary that they filmed for Naughty Dog's The Last of Us. Uh, they were really, really crucial in making this a reality. So thanks very much to Area 5. And I also wanted to say another special thanks to Sarah Brin, John Toba, and the rest of the team at MoCA who very graciously agreed to host uh, this conference for us and partner with us to produce what I hope you'll agree is an exciting day. Uh, and to that end, I'd also like to bring up Emma Reeves, the creative director of MoCA TV, who'd like to say a few words about their upcoming series, Art and Video Games, which will explore a lot of the same things that you'll see here today. Thank you so much for coming. It's fantastic to see a kind of new type of audience coming down to MoCA. We're downtown in Los Angeles, um, and it's really great. You know, hopefully this can be something that could be an ongoing relationship. Um, MoCA TV is, a, is one of those official YouTube channels, and we've um, started uh, on the 1st of October. Um, early on in the thoughts about programming, we were, you know, we were looking at all sorts of creative fields, which weren't necessarily getting the exposure that would mean a conventional uh, museum exhibition. And um, being here in, in Los Angeles on the West Coast, generally, started to see that there was so much creativity around the, you know, the indie video game community. And we, we've actually started to produce a series, which is still actually in the, in the process of being made. You know, it's called The Art in Video Games. Um, we're hoping to start screening episodes in the fall. Um, and, but the thing is that's, that's, that's amazing, but also makes, makes production very difficult, is that we're constantly finding new stories. There's incredible, um, e extraordinary esoteric video games, which you, know, you all know far better than I do, but every time we think we've completed our series, we find another one. So we're making w multiple episodes, uh, having a look at the, you know, a window on this world, which, which is, is, is really extraordinary. So we have a little teaser for the, for the series, but it really doesn't reflect the breadth of, of what will come uh, t later on um, this year. Thank you very much. We are, as a society, more demanding of experiences. We want them to mean more. We want them to challenge us intellectually and emotionally in the same way that they have challenged us playfully. <laughs> that means that we as game designers need to step up and make experiences that give us the kinds of deep, adult, meaningful experiences that this generation expects. I think that it's an evolution of games. So to officially kick things off, I'd like to bring up our first developer who basically needs zero introduction. Uh, over the past year, we've watched them firsthand take back control over their studio and their games with the help of their massive community of appreciative fans. So please give a warm welcome to Greg Rice from Double Fine. All right, thanks for coming out, guys. Um, so a little over a year ago, as part of our quest to become more financially independent uh, and to engage more directly with our community, uh, we at Double Fine launched a Kickstarter campaign to create a point-and-click adventure game led by Tim Schafer. 
Um, we wanted to make a kind of game that fans have been asking us for for many years, one that has that trademark Schaefer wit and allows the player to get lost in a unique and beautiful world. And we wanted to do it in the open, right alongside our community. Luckily, we got the chance to do just that. Uh, the development process has been amazing so far and has resulted in what is now known as Broken Age. Uh, so here to tell you a little more about what it's been like is a video from our lovely Double Fine Adventure backers. Remember the day where I was on my computer reading the news and I see the headline, Double Fine to kickstart new adventure game. There's no way this is true. And it, it was. <laughs> I grew up playing adventure games. Manic Mansion, Monkey Island, uh, Day of the Tentacle, Full Throttle, which are my favorite adventure games. Um, Grand Fandango was my favorite game of all time. And as I grew up, I was like, I'm trying to play more and more of those games, but they started disappearing. I miss the old days of when we had games that were driven by a, a creative narrative. Where everything is new and wondrous and expansive. I love the puzzles that are in adventure games. I will pay way more money for a game that tests my smarts. It's just really grabbing for all ages and all audiences. And I think that's what everyone here is looking for, that kernel that Double Fine seems to have such an innate grasp of. So when I heard about a Double Fine adventure game Kickstarter, there was no hesitation. I backed the hell out of it. Because, damn it, I believe in the little guy. Tim Schafer. I look big, but he's little. Where it counts. After I contributed, I was actually up all night refreshing the page on the Kickstarter website, and it was so, so amazing to see the numbers just get higher and higher. It was a weird phenomenon just to see, you know, people passionate about adventure games, interested in learning about how games are made. We're taking a journey with the creators as they go through it and make decisions about what the game is going to look like and what parts are going to make it and not. I've already gotten my money's worth, even though I haven't even played the game yet, uh, because I've been able to watch the documentaries and really just feel a part of this process and see everything come together. My favorite parts is when Tim actually asked us backers to help brainstorm ideas, and somebody actually did concept art of Origami Land. They're actually listening to their community. They're actually changing things up a bit. The programmers actually coming in and explaining the process to the people. We'd all get together and we'd all watch it when a new one would finally come out. We had to wait for each other. It was like a new Game of Thrones episode. That was so cool. I never thought about how they go from concept to something real and then revision. Redoing everything over from the start. It was nice to see you guys struggle not having enough money and having to struggle a little bit to get through everything, put things in a, a nice perspective. These things happen, it's a creative process. And it really is looking like it's shaping up to be great. Um, I love the art style, I think it's fantastic. Really can't wait to experience the story that's waiting for us there. And it's been so fun and inspiring as I'm working on a game of my own right now. To a certain point, I feel like we've even gotten to know a lot of the team working on it. Almost like build a relationship with the developers of this game, of this awesome company. And I never would have had that experience if I hadn't become a backer. I love double fine now. Double fine loves me. Loves me. <laughs> so, uh, we put a new gameplay video in there for you guys as well. But yeah, we've enjoyed this experience so much that uh, just two weeks ago we launched another Kickstarter campaign to fund another one of our teams at Double Fine uh, to create Massive Chalice, a tactical strategy game with an epic fantasy timeline. Our fans have once again how shown incredible they are, and they have come out in support of us. Um, that project's now funded, and more and more backers are joining in on the fun as we enter the final two weeks of the campaign. But those are just two of five self-published PC games currently being developed at Double Fine. Uh, one other being the previously announced Drop Chord, coming out this fall and developed in partnership with Dracogen and Leap Motion. But today, we're proud to announce another very exciting partnership. Uh, please welcome to the stage indie fund partner, Kelly Santiago. 
Yes. So I'm really excited and honored to announce on behalf of Indie Fund um, that Indie Fund, along with a group of top games industry professionals, um, will be funding an additional two original titles from Double Fine, and you'll be hearing more information in the coming months about both. Thank you, guys. Uh, so next up is a game that we caught a very faint glimpse of earlier this week that's instantly become one of my most anticipated games. Uh, here to give us a slightly longer look is Nathan Vella and Chris Piotrowski from Toronto's Cappy. Oh, wow, internet's everywhere. I love it. So uh, I'm Nathan Vella. I'm the co-founder and president at Cappy. I'm uh, Chris Piotrowski, the creative director of Cappy. Also in the audience is Sylvain, Kenneth, and Vic from Cappy, and I just want to say hi to the whole crew back home in Toronto. What's up, dudes? So Cappy started out as a small studio making small games and have gradually grown to be able to make literally the type of games that we always dreamed of making. Um, on top of the game that we're going to talk about here below, we're also, going, we're also developing uh, Super Time Force, our crazy-ass time-rewinding run-and-gun platformer. But the game that we probably are best known for is collaborating with Super Brothers and Jim Guthrie on Sword and Sorcery. Uh, when we started working on Below quite a while ago, uh, Sorcery had wrapped up and we had such an amazing experience working with Jim that we knew right away uh, we would probably murder him if we didn't get to work with him on it. Um, so lucky for us, Jim was on our side and uh, joined the team and the fact that we get to make a new game that we're so excited about alongside one of our best friends and one of the most talented people we know, uh, it, it's just an amazing experience. But enough with that, let's get to the meat of it and talk a little bit about Below. Hello. Uh, so as uh, Nathan mentioned, it's another collaboration with uh, Cappy and uh, Jim Guthrie. Um, Below is um, sort of our take on a quiet, uh, moody adventure game heavily influenced by uh, roguelikes, uh, which kind of builds on the aesthetic and uh, design ideas that we started exploring with, uh, with Sorcery uh, and takes them a little bit further. Um, it's a game that has uh, no text, no dialogue, uh, no hints, and no hand-holding. Uh, a game that's about exploration in uh, every sense of the word. So in Below, uh, players take the role of a tiny lone wanderer who arrives on a mysterious island. And uh, progress and sort of success in Below depends entirely on exploration. Um, exploration of the game environment and all of its tiny little details and their, their meaning. Um, exploration of the nuances of the game controls and uh, exploration of the game world and the systems and the history that's alive within it. Um, as players become better at surviving the various pitfalls and labyrinths of Below, um, the history and the depths of the depths uh, and the game's themes slowly reveal themselves to the player. So uh, at the Microsoft press conference, we showed you a little glimpse. So we thought, you know what, let's show a little bit more uh, and amp up the Jim Guthrie a little bit while we're at it.
just want to say quickly uh, thanks to everyone at Horizon and Ellie Mocha for uh, putting this thing together and letting us uh, show you a little bit more about the game. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so next up, I'm super pleased to introduce the team behind the game that I believe was uh, the most exciting revelation of last year's E3. Uh, please welcome up Rex Crowell and Shoban Reddy, who actually is here but is sort of hiding uh, in the back room there. Uh, they're from Media Molecule, and they're going to show you some really awesome stuff. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Rex. Uh, I'm a lead creator on Tearaway. Lead tear away, if you will. Uh, and Siobhan, as Brandon was saying, is, is also here, but she's being kidnapped in the back room because we didn't have a, a, a HDMI cable that will run all the way back uh, to where things have to run to, to the um, display computer. Um, so we'll just kick things off by uh, fusing the worlds of uh, tear away and horizon together. So uh, Tearaway is our, uh, our, our papercraft world. Um, it's an adventure in a, in a papercraft world. Um, and it's just such an honor to be here today uh, with all these other just beautiful, beautiful games. And because this, this conference is just uh, a little different from other places that we might have shown the game, uh, we thought we'd go for a, a slightly different approach. Um, instead of showing uh, really epic, huge things, I wanted a chance to show really tiny things. Um, I zoomed in, look at some of the elements that I think are really beautiful and make our game um, not just look distinctive, but feel a little different as well. Um, this, this will be kind of like uh, seeing a bunch of animated GIFs that condense the game down into, into tiny things. Um, so the main thing about our world, I think, is that it's very squashy. It wants, to be, it wants to be walked through. We really want to encourage the player to just, to just keep going on this journey throughout the environment. So as they're running, the, the paper sheets are all kind of squashing down and the, and the blades of grass are all flipping around. And um, it really just kind of spurs you on on your journey, particularly when you see some puddles. You know, you want to want to get jumping in those puddles and splash about. And, even when the, the journey gets a little more, um, uh, feels a, a little more ominous, you've still, still got some kind of beautiful raindrops coming down and uh, splashing around you as you, as you stride over uh, bridges, squidgy bridges um, that are all kind of deforming under your feet. And this is all to really give a very touchy feel, uh, feel to the world um, because this tactileness is, isn't just for the messenger character uh, inside the game. Uh, it's for you as well, the person that's holding their world. So uh, here you can see I'm rubbing on the front of the Vita and all those things that were squashing down are also squashing down under my fingers and slightly freaking out the character inside the game. Um, even the, uh, the charming wildlife uh, is there for, right for the... <laughs> No squirrels were harmed in the making of this video. Um, and, and just shaking the world, it, you know, it's a world that's in your, in your hands, so just giving it a shake, it, it wibbles around and shakes. And, and it's also with the, with the microphone that's running in the background, it picks up on background noise. So uh, if you're kind of at a party, then suddenly the, 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 the skies are filling with particles. And uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if the apple, you know, our dubstep apples are kicking off there. Um, yeah, it's just a, a lot of, a lot of um, I think, beauty in the world, um, lots of, lots of colour, lots of joy, but with some sort of darker um, folklore tales to find underneath the surface. So we're just going to try and do a very, very quick live demo of one of the like, really surprising interactions you have in the game. Uh, we're going to switch to the Vita now, live from the back room. Is it? There we go. So you can see there that the, the paper on the floor is very thin and Siobhan's waving her hand under it and you can see how it's actually, it actually looks like tracing paper. Um, and a little tap on the back of the Vita and up pops her finger 
to uh, uh, tear into the world. It's using the video feed, so uh, you, would, you would see whatever's on the floor beneath. Put some multiple fingers in and chase these little guys around and flip them up in the air and kind of just play around with the environment in a very, in a very tactile way, including getting them stuck on the screen. And the whole purpose of the game is to, is to bring the character back to you, as you can see in the sun, the, mo the most beautiful thing in the game. <laughs> and we, we, all, of this, all of this paper and this tactileness is really there to just encourage players. Could we, could we flip back to the slides? Is that possible? Yeah, all of this tactileness is to really, uh, really encourage players to create their own papercraft as they're travelling through the world. They get their own plans and make their own versions. You can see a whole host of different versions of our squirrel here that uh, friends of ours have made so far. Um, kind of quite, quite a, quite a range. Um, because papercraft and photography as well are just very, very inclusive, and I think anyone can really do them and, and join in and just add to the, the texture of the game. Um, I mean, we, we can't even stop it ourselves. Here's us decorating our booth the other day down on the show floor and um, just cutting out paper and gluing it up is a lot of fun, particularly if you start to add it to other people's games as well. Uh, so I'm just going to finish up by showing you our latest trailer that shows how all of this comes together into a, into a beautiful paper world. Uh, so next up is a team that I've been watching very closely as they've sort of turned into a super force leading a renaissance for local multiplayer games. Uh, please welcome Ramiro Corbetta and Duguta Fabrique's Doug Wilson. Hey everyone, I'm Doug Wilson from Duguta Fabrique. I'm Ramiro Corbetta, not from Duguta Fabrique. Uh, and we're here to show you our game, Sports Friends. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sports Friends is a collection of local multiplayer games. Uh, it's actually four games made by four different people. And the reason we brought these games together is because we, we just wanted that one game that you buy when all your friends are coming to your house and you just, you know, you want to be in front of the screen and playing with everyone and having a good time. Uh, so yeah, we're going to show a few new features, but first uh, we're going to show a new little trailer that we made. Sports Friends, Super Pole Riders, Okra, Johann Sebastian Joust, Arabari Ball,
So yeah, Hokra, as I said, is uh, it, sorry, Sports Friends is a collection of four games, and they're they're all made by different people. So we're gonna go through each of the games uh, briefly, and then at the end we're gonna focus on uh, Paul Ryder's a bit. Uh, so my game uh, is called Hokra, and uh, I, I mean I think a bunch of you have played it, but I've been working on it. Uh, to basically try to differentiate, I used to have only one level, and I've been I've been really working on making these new. I've been calling them arenas, I guess, uh, and putting a lot of new little features in it. Like you know, this this one is it, this level is called Tokyo, and it has uh, this area in the middle that makes you as you go through it, you move really slowly, and it has these walls that are hard to cross, and has a different goal <laughs> setup. Uh, and then I was thinking, I was like, you know, if I'm if, if I'm making all these new features, maybe I should let people make their own levels. So. Uh, the thing I've been working on the most is this new level builder where uh, people can just make their own arenas and it's kind of this idea that you have your own home arena and your friends come over and you've made this level that they have to play and uh, you hopefully are good at it and you can beat them and it's, you know, it's a little cheap, which is nice. Um, so my game is uh, the motion control game played with the PlayStation Move that you saw in the video teaser. It's called Johann Sebastian Joust. Um, and I've been Hard at work adding a bunch of new gameplay features and modes and stuff like choose your own music and special sudden death modes and special power-ups. Uh, but what I want to talk about a little bit just quickly here is uh, I want to announce that we have new visuals uh, by a Montreal-based illustrator, Dominic Dom2D Furland. And I'm really, really thrilled. Here's uh, just a little concept of you know, these Baroque characters who uh, will be animated and on the screen, here's a little uh, Vine preview of, of the animations. And I, you know, so you might be asking, well, Doug, this is a no graphics game where you look at each other, not the screen. Why are you doing visuals for this game? Uh, but you know, I thought it was really important to kind of frame the experience and set a nice mood with these silly uh, Baroque characters that fit the uh, Johann Sebastian Bach music well. And yeah, I'm really thrilled by the kind of just colorful, uh, silly mood that really matches the silliness of the gameplay. And yep, so we'll be working more uh, on these visuals and more gameplay features. And uh, yeah, that's Johann Sebastian Joust. So Bar Bar Ball is uh, a game by Noah Sasso, who's back in New York. He didn't come to LA with us. Uh, but he's been working, just, just like Hokra, he's also been working on these new arenas uh, and just making a bunch of you know, different levels so the game feels different. But uh, he's really been focusing on, on this idea of making the game uh, really balanced for high level play. And Noah has actually been showing the game at a bunch of fighting game tournaments and trying to get really high level fighting players uh, to go against each other in the game. And uh, he's actually gonna be running a tournament at EVO this year, the, you know, the top fighting tournament. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's, that's what Noah has been up to. Uh, and finally, what we'll focus on just a little bit here, uh, and we have some volunteers who are going to play a little with us, they can come up right now, uh, is the fourth game in Sports Friends uh, called Super Pole Riders here on the screen. It's by uh, Dr. Bennett Foddy, who is uh, best known for his silly browser games Quop and GURP and other such silly physics-based sports games, uh, which Super Rider, Pole Riders is very much uh, part of that uh, style. Take the sounds so you can hear Bennett's sounds. And yeah, uh, Pol Super Pole Riders is a totally overhauled new version of his free browser game Pole Riders, but he's redone it with a totally new visual style. We've got it coming up on the screen. Uh, I'm going to let them play a little bit while I talk through it. Uh, one of the changes you can see is that it also supports two versus two now for kind of like extra pole riding chaos. What you see going on here are two teams, uh, and they're each trying to kick or hit the ball into their target, into their goal. And uh, you can also kind of step and hit the other guy, your opponent, out for a little bit. And it's a physics-based game, physics-based game played uh, only with the two analog control sticks. So you move your character with one stick, and you aim your pole and move your pole with another stick. And Bennett's uh, working on a number of different arenas with different geometries. A little goal. Uh, yeah, and a bunch of uh, kind of different modes and characters. And yeah, this is the madness that is Super Pole Riders. It's, it's kind of deliberately uh, a little crazy, but there's also a competitive depth to it. So it's, it's like the Sports Friends games, it's a game that you can get better at over time and play competitively. Uh, but it's also a fun game for spectators because it's 
kind of out of control. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's basically it for now, but that's, that's Super Pole Riders. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's Sports Friends. Uh, we got a new website, and yeah, that new video teaser you saw. Um, up on the website, you can also pre-order the game. We're uh, offering Slacker Backer access uh, for people who are desperate to get in on the early alphas, which you could play right now for all four games. And uh, the game will be coming out on the PlayStation 3 this fall, uh, followed by a home computer release shortly after. Uh, yeah, so that's Sports Friends. Um, the thing is, at De Gouda Fabrique, uh, we're also working on another game project, which I wanted to talk about just real briefly. The game is called Mutazione, and it's kind of the opposite of Sports Friends, which is a little confusing. Uh, it's a illustrated, kind of quiet, single-player game, uh, controlled uh, kind of in a similar style and inspired by old games like Another World. And it's a game uh, about this protagonist there in the center, her name is Kai, and Kai gets into a motorcycle accident well, one day and wakes up in this kind of strange, tropical, derelict world. And she finds her way through the jungle uh, into a town called Mutaseone, full of strange uh, and, but friendly mutants. And the game is very much about uh, exploring this town and kind of making your, making your home in this town and getting to know these characters. And it's very much a, a character-driven kind of story. Here are some of the inhabitants of the town and the world. And like I mentioned, it's kind of less of like an, it's not really like an epic tale about saving the world. It's more almost like a soap opera in this town and, and getting to know, you know these people and these strange mutants. And so, you know, like, like a traditional adventure game, uh, you're exploring this town and you can go from different places and talk to these characters in these you know, different buildings and these different areas of the town. But it's also about exploring uh, the town in time as, as well as space. So here's, here's Kai um, in her little tree house in the morning and also in the afternoon and in the evening and at night. And so the town has a schedule to it at different times of days. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the characters do different things in different places. And um, a little bit inspired by uh, Majora's Mask, we really wanted to have this sense of like a living, breathing place that you get to know and talk to these characters in different contexts, kind of understand the different relationships between these characters and, you know, try to, again, make your home in this town of Mutasane. Um, you know, finally, uh, we also kind of wanted to do something a little bit more than the uh, traditional adventure game in that we wanted to let the players do something a little uh, creative and expressive. And so one of the main systems behind the game is this plant growing, this gardening mechanic. So here's a bunch of plants uh, that you can grow in, in your garden. And the idea is each plant makes a different set of sounds. And that's, that's what you're hearing in the back here. It's, it's my music engine that I, I've been working a lot on with the game with uh, Alessandro Coronas, who is the, also the composer behind Where's My Heart. And so I'm working with him on this procedural music system uh, that you grow, this, this, this ambient uh, music piece. And so it's kind of like a create your own Brian Eno's music for airports Thing that's, that's going on. And so yeah, I'm really excited and proud about the music system. Uh, the game is concepted and illustrated by uh, the Gute Fabrique founder, Nils Nienikin, and I'm also working with another programmer and friend, George Buckingham, to create the game. And so it's still uh, very much in the early stages, but I have a uh, rough uh, early tech demo, if anyone here wants to see it after, after the show. And yeah, we have a new website, Mutasione Game, where you can sign up for our mailing list. Hopefully we'll have some juicy story-related updates in the future. And yeah, that's Mutasione. Thank you. So uh, next up, we've got another game that I've been watching evolve into one of the most beautiful playgrounds to explore in video games. Uh, so please welcome up Richard Hogg and from Honey Slug, Ricky Haggett. Hello there. 
Hello. Uh, I'm, I'm Ricky. Um, I, I'm one of the co-founders of a, a London-based independent games uh, developer called Honey Slug. Um, and yeah. Hi, I'm Richard Hogg. I'm, I'm a, an artist and an illustrator. And I'm working with Honey Slug on the game um, Hohokum. So um, Hohokum is a, a kind of colorful, exploring, surprising, exuberant game. Um, where you control this thing and you fly around. Um, if anyone's here at E3, they can still play it on um, PlayStation 4 and Vita over at the Sony stand. Um, and it's coming to uh, PS4, PS3, and Vita in 2014. Um, we're working on this game with um, Sony Santa Monica. And we wanted to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the music in this game. Um, we're incredibly excited to announce um, our collaboration with a record label. Um, called Ghostly International, which features some of our favorite musicians. Yeah, I, so we've been making this game for quite a long time. It was, um, it was in the IGF in 2011 and in Indicade in that year as well. And we were making it for a couple of years before then. And for the whole time, we've kind of had an evolving playlist of music that kind of inspires us, that I listen to when I'm drawing the stuff, and also the, um, the sort of music we'd want to be in the game. And, um, and that, ha that playlist always had quite a few songs on it by, by artists who are on the Ghostly label. When we started working with the guys at Sony Santa Monica, they were like, well, um, we should try and get some of these artists to make music for the game, which I would never have believed in a million years that would happen. And so they got in touch, and uh, yeah, so we're really excited to be able to announce that all of the music in the whole game is made by Ghostly artists. And, um, and we've already been working with some of them, sort of working in really nice collaborations where they're playing the game and, and, and talking to us about it, and. Uh, not all of the music's original. There's some, there's some music that's already out there that you'll be familiar with that, that, that fits really well into certain bits of our game. But quite a lot of it is original. And um, the tra we're about to show you the trailer. And the piece of music that's in the trailer is by the musician Tycho and is, is an original composition that he's made for our game. And yeah, shall we show the trailer? Yeah, yeah. I just the right That's right, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so next up is a developer who at this time last year I had never even heard of before, uh, but he's super quickly become another one of my favorites. Uh, you might know his work as one of the level designers on the PlayStation 3 game The Unfinished Swan. Uh, now he's on his own creating something amazing. So please welcome Ben Esposito from Little Flag. Is the sound on? Cool. Whoa. <laughs> um, I'm very uh, thankful to be here. The other games are amazing. Tycho's awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm here on behalf of a company called Little Flag, um, and it's just me. Um, 
And oh yeah, I also wanted to give a shout out to the streamers out there. Um, thanks for being on the internet. Uh, okay. Wow. I'm so good at this. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I've been working on this game um, by myself called Kachina, and it's uh, I describe it as a whimsical physics toy um, that takes place in the American Southwest, and I've been given the opportunity to do this um, through Indie Fund. Um, so I'm being supported by them to kind of explore a lot of ideas that I really wanted to do for a really long time. Um, so I don't have a snappy trailer or anything. I'm just going to show you the game and kind of like talk through it a little bit and show you a little, a few new things if you've seen it already. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, so I'm <laughs> let's just do this. Okay, so. Um, the game is really simple and has a pretty simple look, um, but the premise is that you control a hole in the ground, and all the objects are physical, and you can um, suck stuff up in order to get larger. Okay, pretty cool. Um, so there's various characters that do uh, different things. Um, and this one, uh, I introduced the ability to launch stuff back out of the hole. And so you can use this for puzzles and hijinks and all sorts of other silly stuff. <laughs> um, so each level is kind of a bit of a, a poem, or in this case, a, a stupid joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, they kind of like, there's a narrative element that I'm developing right now. And I'll show you a tiny, tiny bit of. It's supposed to be dirt, not poop. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so another one of the elements that I'm playing a lot with is um, what happens inside of the hole that might be out of sight and might be something a little surprising. So in this case, we've got these like monsters or something. Oh no, they're bunnies, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you suck them up, they do various surprising things. <laughs> I don't know why you're surprised. Cool, um, and then I wanted to show one, one uh, brand new thing in the game, so, um, the game kind of explores um, themes of like uh, Native American, um, like our relationship with like the Native Americans and how we build um, cities and how uh, people are displaced. And so I wanted well, the the new mechanic that I'm showing is you the ability to take the perspective of various other characters in the game. So in this case you can take the perspective of this guy here and you can kind of look up into the clouds and in this one you can open up a hole in the cloud and start to take objects out. Whoa. And then you can go back and the objects are on the ground barbecue or something. Whoa. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, that's all I'm going to demo for today. Um. Yeah, I wanted to thank everyone again, thank Horizon, and thank Mocha, um, and have an awesome day. Okay, so, oops, I spoiled the surprise there. So finally, uh, we've got one last new team to bring up on stage uh, who have some tremendously exciting news. So please welcome Robin Hunicky, former producer of the game that basically won all of the awards this year, Journey, uh, and Katamari Damacy and Nobi Nobi Boy creator, Keita Takahashi. Hello, everybody. Um, so I am Robin Hunicky. And this is Kira Takashi. 
and uh, we're here to tell you a little story today. Um, but first, we are video game romantics. Venus Patrol, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> So we just wanted to say thank you to all the amazing games that were showcased here today. Developers like this are the reason that Kate and I make games and we're just so happy to be here and to have all of you see them, especially in this context. So um, Kate and I believe that video games are joyful and wonderful. And when I say that, I mean uh, we believed it a long time ago when we were much younger and had longer hair and were perhaps <laughs> a bit too serious. <laughs> um, what we wanted to talk to you today is about how we became who we are and how we met. So I believe that our passionate understanding of how games can connect people and bring joy is why we met and why we're standing in front of you here today. In fact, it's why everyone is here today. Uh, but it had something to do with this little guy here in the foreground. Uh, before Kate and I met, I was uh, studying computer science and I was teaching myself to make video games. Uh, this is a photo of me in 2002 at the Indie Game Jam. And uh, I was studying robotics and interested in AI and storytelling, so it's no surprise that I ended up working on my sims. And uh, it was a really awesome experience and led me on this journey to where I'm standing today. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, Keita was studying sculpture and art at school. He was very interested in the idea that he could take everyday objects and make them magical. So in a way, it's not a surprise that he also ended up making video games. And our passion for games uh, meant that I was able to see his game at Tokyo Game Show in 2003. And as soon as I saw it on the show floor, they're hiding in the back of the Namco booth. I knew that I needed to meet him in person. And so I was lucky enough to have the support of the Game Developers Conference. We were able to bring him over to give a presentation at the Experimental Gameplay Workshop in 2004. And Keita's short but meaningful presentation about what video games meant to him and why he was making Katamari Damacy was uh, so well received by the press that the game was actually translated and brought to the United States, much to the delight of many people here. It was really awesome. <laughs> As a fan and a person who loves independent games and creative games and games that push the boundaries, I was so overwhelmed and I began actually corresponding with Keita through a translator and we became friends. Um, we would meet up at conferences uh, much like this and we would go into the corner, draw in our notebooks and talk about video games. And drawing was often the way we communicated because unfortunately while Keita was raised speaking Japanese, I was not. <laughs> so um, he will be embarrassed for me to say this in public but I believe that his drawings are the best thing ever. <laughs> and over the years um, I have seen so many of his notebooks. These are just a few of the drawings that he's done that show his fantastic fascination with physical play and joyful play, being a child, the joy that we feel when we are small, and how we can translate that into experiences for when we are big. So we talked about this stuff a lot as we were working on our own games across both sides of the ocean. And uh, Kata began focusing more and more on physical play, um, thinking about how to make games for smaller uh, uh, applications like iPhone and iPad and uh, at the same time I spend some time thinking about how people play together and what that means and how it can bring us together. So we realized uh, late last year that it might be time for us to collaborate on a new big game and so that's what we're announcing today. Um, as I said previously, uh, English is not Kata's primary language um, and we're both a little bit still shy about our demo. Um, so what we're going to do is he's going to tell you a little bit about his inspirations for this new game that we're working on. Hi. Hey. Hi, fine. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, so my new game idea came from when I played with my son. <laughs> he's two years old. I guess he's eating bananas. <laughs> <laughs> I made a game about prince and king, then about boy and girl, and this time I'm making a game about mayor and deputies. <laughs> and this is my first sketch of the world. Imagine blocks coming to life. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Keita. <laughs> so 
as some of you may already know, uh, just uh, at the beginning of this year, myself and Martin Middleton, who also worked on Journey, co-founded this company called Phenomena, that's how you say it, Phenomena, uh, with the explicit goal of bringing these kinds of games to life. And having met with Kata in Vancouver, talked with him a bunch and stuff, we really felt that this was the time that we could do this. Um, bringing him into Phenomena, having him collaborate with us on this game is basically a dream come true. It's like, so awesome. There is certainly a lot more that we could say about the game. Um, what I can say right now is that when I play the build, it gives me the same feeling inside that I got when I played the little dung beetle game that became Katamari. And we are really hoping that as we reveal details about the game, you feel the same way too. So we don't want to take too much of your time today. We do have the build with us. And if you come back later this evening, perhaps we'll be able to show it to you. For those of you out there um, who are not able to see it, uh, we will be giving you details about the game on our Twitter, uh, which is Phenomena, and at Phenomena.com. And we just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came today to show us their lovely games and to remind you Ta -ta -da! to have some fun. Thank you. So that's all of the people we have here with us today, uh, but we do have one last thing that we want to share with all of you. Uh, so let's take a look at that now. So that's it. Uh, thanks again to everyone that's made this day possible. And for everyone here, we hope we'll see you again tonight, uh, right back here at MoCA at 5 p.m. for food, drinks, and even more games.